In the current age of gaming, there is a ton of games out there. Today's video is the first of a long series where I ramble for probably longer than I should about games I enjoy, and mostly games that are quite old. And the first video of the series will be about Fallout 3, a game that's been out for 12 years, but a game I still come back and play time and time again. While not my personal favorite Fallout game, Fallout 3 has some incredible mechanics and features that just make it all the more exciting to play again. From its incredible side quests, to story, to DLC, to setting, let's wander the wasteland one more time and talk about the world of Fallout 3. This video assumes that you've played Fallout 3. While it's not a requirement, of course, it would help to have some background knowledge of some of the things brought up in the video. But as I said, it's not a requirement, so even if you haven't played the game, you could still sit back and listen. For those who haven't played the game or need a refresher, though, let's go over what exactly is Fallout. Fallout 3 is 200 years after the bombs fell in Washington, D.C. Fallout has never given the player a name, more of an identity, with Fallout 3's protagonist being the lone wanderer, someone who grew up in one of the vaults. The intro has many time skips of our early years, from birth to baby to teenager, just to get us equipped with what life is like in the vault, until we wake up one day and our father has left that vault, something completely forbidden and arguably the worst crime a vault dweller can commit. We have no choice but to leave the vault alone in search of our father, hence the name, the lone wanderer. From a gameplay perspective, Fallout 3 added some original mechanics and unique twists on the usual mechanics in RPG games. Skills and perks are staple of the genre, and while those do exist in Fallout, they are organized slightly differently. Your beginning stats are called your special stats, which let you change your character to your liking. More strength means more carry weight, more luck has the potential to land more crits, things of that nature. Leveling up is XP based, which you earn by discovering locations, completing quests, and killing things. You're then given skill points to put into the many categories before you, all of which give the player a brief idea of what this increases. Afterward comes the option of picking a perk to add more strength to the character. Some of these skills and perks can be useful in checks during dialogue to either complete an objective quicker or hear the unique dialogue. Fall 3 also has a karma system like the Paragon and Renegade of Mass Effect, but I always found that it closely related to the good and evil system of Fable. Certain actions can give negative karma or positive karma to the player. Disarming a bomb gives positive karma, but stealing would give them negative karma. Each have their own reasons for existing in the game's world. But Fallout's unique mechanic is VATS, or vault Tech Assisted Targeting System. Activation of VATS pauses the game, allowing the player to select different body parts to attack. We'll delve more into this in the combat section of the video, but that's just the general basis of what VATS is. While we will be discussing lots of Fallout 3's quests and missions, all of them have something in common, which is they all take place in the Capital Wasteland. Minus the DLCs, all your time will be spent here, discovering locations, looting, killing bad guys, killing good guys, all of it is in here in the Capital Wasteland. It's a post-apocalyptic version of DC, with some original locations like Rivet City, but also real-life locations and monuments like the Jefferson Memorial. Throughout the Wasteland, you come across the relics of the past, old vending machines and buildings that, while aren't untouched, aren't also completely destroyed either. Because of the primal nature of the world, that means people are going to act in primal ways. People of the wasteland would rather shoot you than speak with you. Everyone is now fending for themselves in this wasteland and can sometimes even join groups. The wasteland is the furthest from safe, with drugged up fiends all over the place looking for the next person to rob, as well as the super mutants who will mutilate any human they find. It's harder to find a safe place in the wasteland than a hostile one. Of course, the factions mark their territory, with dismembered hanging corpses usually symbolizing raiders and bags of guts being the super mutants, so you know what kind of situation you're going to be dealing with. But not everybody is bad, like the people of Megaton and Rivet City who are just trying to provide a peaceful residential experience away from the harsh wasteland to make the people feel at home again. Then there are the neutral places, people who like to stick to themselves like the people of Andale and Canterbury Commons, people who extend a helping hand to those in need but aren't crowded like Rivet City and definitely aren't kidnapping people like the Raiders. Well, maybe. Of course, that leaves the lone group of the Vault Dwellers, neither bad nor good, as they can't have any contact with anyone outside, so to them, they just assume that they're the only ones left. While the individual Vault Dweller may be an asshole to someone, the whole faction as a whole doesn't really have a specific side to play, so they're just neutral. These places bring life to the wasteland, as ironic as that sounds. That's why exploring is fun to do in this game. Not only gameplay-wise are you getting XP and leveling up, but you're learning more of the story of the game, meeting new people, and just taking in the scenery. Fallout 3 is a large world, with many places to go, and there are a few iconic places I wanted to 
bring up to convey the range of these places one might encounter. There are the neutral places that we discussed before, like Andale, Canterbury Commons, and Arafu. Simple residential areas, but have a deeper story. Andale seems like a small, rundown block of houses with a few residents. Everyone is happy, though, like, too happy, as we figure out one of the houses in the basement has corpses of random wastelanders. The residents have been eating people who come to town to feed on their families and don't take too kindly to visitors who invade their privacy. The Arafu residents have taken the liberty of living on a broken highway with one entrance and one exit, except they've been targeted by a group called the Family, self-proclaimed vampires. One of the residents of Arafu was taken by the family and is confused on what side to choose, as it's a decision that'll determine his whole future. He can stick with the family, but he has to drink blood for the rest of his life, or he can go back to Arafu, but now he's considered an orphan as his parents are dead, and the townspeople are having trouble defending the family anyway, so who's to say they won't just take him back? The people of Canterbury Commons have had a peaceful life until it became a battleground for two people, the Antagonizer and the Mechanist. The Wasteland really brings out the most interesting people sometimes, especially like the people who just want to live it up even though the world is ending, like Dukov, who has had more bottles of alcohol in his room than I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, seriously, where the fuck does he get all these? Of course, every now and then you'll come across the more questionable places like Paradise Falls, a group of slavers that just house slaves so they can be bought. You can even join them and capture people for them for caps. Definitely a place you want to avoid if you're just a normal wastelander roaming around in the waste. A very common yet less talked about part of the game is the metros, and there's a lot to find underneath the wasteland. While it's not the most visually pleasing of places, as most areas do look the same, they are useful for the wanderer who wants to find tons of loot, as long as they're okay with the abundance of raiders, super mutants, and ghouls that also like to take refuge in here. Besides the morally good places like Rivet City, as we've already mentioned them, the last places we haven't briefly discussed yet are the vaults. The vaults, while cool, haven't really been a large selling point. There's the promise of a new world to explore, places to go, and the RPG elements that are marketed. It's never been about the vaults. They're usually just used as a beginning setting for the main protagonist. Except players know why they're so great, as they're not exactly what you think. There are 122 vaults in the United States. 17 of those are normal vaults. I say normal as the whole point of them was not to protect the American American people. That was more of a front to hide the experiments they would perform in there. Each vault in Fallout 3 has some underlying story for the player to discover. Once the player finds out that everything isn't what it seems, they now become a huge part of the future games. Now when they buy those future games like New Vegas and Fallout 4, exploring a vault isn't the same anymore. Something sinister is going on in there and you want to figure out why. Fallout 3 has six vaults, all of which have a purpose. For example, the starting vault 101 was supposed to be closed forever so that Vault Tech could study the effects of the leader when it never opened and how inbreeding would occur considering new people wouldn't be entering the vault, of course. There are two other vaults we come across in the main story, Vault 87 and 112. We'll go over these areas more in the story section of the video, just remember that these two vaults also existed out in the wasteland for the player to explore. The three that we haven't talked about that are optional are Vault 92, 106, and 108. Vault 92 only housed musicians, with the goal of preserving the musical talent in the wasteland, except the true purpose of Vault 92 was to act as a testing ground for the creation of super soldiers by the way of subliminal suggestion. They did this by exposing citizens to white noise that contained hidden messages as a form of hypnosis. Once this step was achieved, they would use hypnosis to make obedient super soldiers. It worked but had disastrous effects, as the inhabitants were filled with insatiable aggression and deteriorating mental states. One subject killed three guards before being put down, and that was after 23 bullets had been already shot into him. And one female resident's writing became more and more incomprehensible as time went on. To make matters worse, the bottom of the vault was flooding, and since the residents were all crazy not doing anything, it explains why there's an abundance of mire lurks upon arriving. Vault 106 was just like 92, with a seemingly normal vault minus the experiments of course. There wasn't some out of place room made to kill people or anything, but psychoactive gas was being pumped into the air systems as these dwellers were used for drug testing, and the overseer knew all of this and was instructed to tell people that everything was fine. Upon entering inside, it's just torn apart, with insane survivors roaming the halls. There is a mini nuke and ammo near the entrance, possibly implying they tried to blow their way out, but that proved unsuccessful. The drugs are still being pumped into the vault when we arrive as well, as we can see tons of hallucinations while we're here. People like Butch, Amada, and our father constantly appear and at one point attack us when walking through these halls. Our last vault and my personal favorite is Vault 108. <laughs> Gary. As you can tell, there are tons of people who look the same named Gary. The vault was supposed to open up in 38 years, except the overseer would die 40 months into serving the vault, the main power supply would die after 20 years, and the vault contained triple the normal ammo stock and zero entertainment recordings, a pretty terrible vault to be placed in. While cloning is a questionable method of reproduction given the circumstances the vault's being 
put in already. Regardless, all the clones became hostile to people who weren't Gary, and after 53 attempts, nothing had changed. So there was 54 Garys in the vault residence, which the Garys overpowered and have now seized control of the vault. This is one of Fallout 3's biggest what-the-fuck moments, as it's just Gary and nobody but Gary is in this vault. The vaults have always been my favorite thing about Fallout, as the story to them is just so unique and interesting that you just want to discover all of them to find out what new sinister thing is behind the giant blast door. And all of these places make up the wasteland. Rivet City, the vaults, Andale, the metro tunnels, and anything else we haven't mentioned all make up the capital wasteland, a vast world to explore and uncover all the small secrets about each location. Whether it's a large, obvious story like the vaults or small places like Super Duper Mart that don't really have a backstory but you can kind of make some inferences just by noticing the environment around you. While some places you can just look around, loot, and leave, not every place is like that. To completely go through an area, you're more than likely going to have to fight your way out or talk your way through it. This is where the gameplay and combat of Fallout 3, though, comes in. From the moment you start, you're given their choice of selecting the special stats. These seven stats provide bonuses to the player. Depending on how you want to make your build for your character, this is a good start to making one. Characters of big guns will need endurance and strength, so the carry weight is high enough to carry those large weapons. People who want a suave talker will put points in a charisma so their speech and barter increases. Simple as that. And if you decide you want to switch up your build, there's always ways to add more points. Sometimes it's as simple as getting a perk that adds points, sometimes it's being addicted to drugs the entire game. After this, it's on the player to level up. This can be done by successfully hacking or lockpicking, completing dialogue checks, killing enemies, discovering locations, or completing quests. Once leaving, the player has a large selection of skills and perks to choose from. Everything shown is every skill in Fallout, all of which have their own benefits, and depending on how you spec your special, the number can be different than mine in the beginning. I don't really think I need to read out all of them as the names are pretty self-explanatory, and of course if you played Fallout 3, you already know what these do. Afterwards is a plethora of perks. Each have certain conditions. Skills like Bloody Mess only require level 6, but some perks require a high enough skill level or special stat. Size Matters, which increases the big gun stat, is a level 8 perk, but also an endurance of 5. But perks like Mr. Sandman are level 10 perks, but also require a sneak of 60 to unlock. What I want to mention and applaud Bethesda for is flexibility, or somewhat of it. In the beginning of my playthrough, I wanted to use base guns. Combat shotgun, assault rifle, 10 mil pistol, but I changed and wanted to switch things up to the Gatling lasers, missiles, and fat mans, because who doesn't want to blow shit up? My specials really didn't help with this, and I did this sort of in the middle of my current playthrough, so I had to level up to get those skills and big guns. The highest level in Fallout is 20, or 30 if you have the Broken Steel DLC, but assuming you prioritize the leveling up fast and getting more skill points per level, you can max out many of the trees in the game. Currently in my playthrough I made for this video, I'm level 27, and only 6 out of the 13 trees aren't level 100. It'll most likely go down to 4 instead of 6, as 2 out of the 6 trees are around 70 in level. Regardless, you can max out many of the stats just from prioritizing your leveling properly, going for perks that increase XP gain, or putting points into a stat without you actually putting any of your current points in it negating the worries of creating a build mid-playthrough. And that's just from leveling up. There's books, armor, and bobblehead stats that could increase this even further. Some armor alters the skills to increase or decrease its value, and reading a skill book can give you one level to whatever skill that is, but prioritizing and using the comprehension perk can give players two points. According to the Fallout wiki, most of these skills have 25 skill books in the game, and there's a bobblehead for every special stat and skill. Each skill bobblehead gives 10 points, and each special bobblehead increases that stat by one. So in theory, a player could max out every tree by getting the skill to level 40 via leveling up, then getting all the skill books in the game with the comprehension perk enabled, making them all 90, then finding every skill bobblehead, turning it to level 100 on every skill. Now this is the 1% strategy as most won't bother to find all these and just level up normally, but going back to my example, getting more than two thirds of the skills in the game maxed out doesn't really give you a build. Yes, in the beginning to mid game, you can customize your build, putting skill points where you want, but you have to put those points somewhere, so you have to dabble in other skills once you've reached the cap. I didn't even really care for explosives or sneak, but I needed to put the points somewhere, and it started becoming less of a designed build and more of into a powerhouse with fully busted max out stats, basically being the master of all trades. And that's always been my biggest gripe with Fallout, but I understand it though, it's rewarding the players who put that time in to level up this much, so I'm not going to nitpick too much on it. Of course, in between leveling up, you are killing things with the help of VATS. VATS, as stated before, was the vault tech assisted targeting system, which pauses time to allow the player to select different parts of the body. Next to each body part is a percentage and a health gauge. The percentage is a culmination of different variables, like the current weapon you're wielding, the amount of visibility of the body part, accuracy, stats, sneak attack, distance between player and target, and tons more, all adding up to a percentage of 0 to 95. The higher the number, the more likely you are to hit that body part. The health gauge shows how close a limb is to crippling. You would think just hit the head, simple as that but each cripple provides bonuses. Crippling the head makes accuracy worse. 
Crippling the body makes the target flinch more. Crippled arms also decrease accuracy but can even make the target drop their weapon. Crippled legs make the target walk slower, making it easier for them to hit again as they try to limp the cover. You can even quote unquote cripple the gun, breaking it entirely or sending it flying out of their hands. Of course, not every creature in Fallout is built with these body parts, so things like ants, robots, and turrets have other parts of them like a sensor. No matter what though, each part provides a bonus should it be crippled, making all options viable and not just the head. Vats uses AP or action points and each gun uses a set amount of them. Things like pistols can fire many rounds before running out of AP, but missiles aren't as fortunate. Of course, if you dislike VATS or don't want to use it in a specific engagement, typical FPS shooting will work just as well, and sometimes is even more effective. Each use of AP with an AR will shoot a couple bullets in a burst, but if the target's health is low enough for only one bullet, then you're just wasting ammo. In weapons like the missile, the flamer, and the minigun, I find more fun just shooting without VATS, as you can put in more rounds into them, killing them faster, instead of going through some scripted sequence of the player shooting especially with the minigun where it needs to spin before firing, and VATS cancels that, making you spin it again if you want to shoot it. Limbs can also cripple without the need of VATS too. VATS just helps make sure that you shoot the correct body part instead of spraying everywhere if your aim isn't good enough. Bethesda provides benefits to both ways, but not allowing too many benefits that one overpowers the other, which makes a nice healthy medium. But you can't use VATS without weapons, right? Thankfully, there's tons of weapons to choose from. Unarmed, melee, small guns, big guns, and energy weapons, there's loads of options for those who level up a specific skill. And if you take a liking to a specific gun, say a hunting rifle or combat shotgun, there's more than likely one, maybe two versions of the same gun, but with a unique name and different stats. For example, the hunting rifle unique version is called Old Painless. The difference being that it does more damage per shot, a faster reload, and a faster rate of fire. Most of the unique guns do simple stat increases like that, but some aren't so simple. The Metal Blaster shoots 9 beams for the price of one, allowing for massive damage assuming they all hit. The unique weapons have always been a nice touch to the game, especially because there's only one of them in the game, so dismantling them or selling them is not recommended unless you truly don't care about the gun at all, meaning there is some real quality to these weapons when you find them. All of these mechanics are the basis of Fallout, killing things, leveling up, looting places, talking with people, and getting quests, and all of the previous things we mentioned, the skills, the perks, the weapons, and the vats are all within those circumstances as well. While the idea of exploring the wasteland with all the mechanics the game provides and the plethora of places to explore is entertaining, there needs to be something that pulls the player in, or at least be used to make sense of our actions, which is the main quest of Fallout 3. Before we can even do anything we mentioned throughout the past 20 minutes, we have to get through the intro. As a baby, we are able to pick our special stats and listen to our dad talk about our mom's favorite bible passage. When we turn 10, we're thrown a birthday party and given the legendary Pip-Boy and able to finally interact with the vault populace. When we turn 16, we take the generalized occupational aptitude test and get to meet all the kids now as adults. The goat decides our skill points we mentioned earlier even though we can change them whenever we want. This is easily one of the best parts of the intro. He who shelters us from the harshness of the atomic wasteland and to whom we owe everything we have including our lives. After the goat, you wake up to the sound of Amada, more years into the future, saying that our dad has left the vault, and that we need to leave too, or we're gonna get killed. As we leave, we explore the wasteland to our heart's content. We'll be focusing on the main story for now. Currently, our main objective is finding our dad and talking to various people. We go from Colin to Three Dog to Dr. Lee, trying to find him. Alternatively, if you remember where Rivet City is located, you could just run there and skip the other two people and never talk to them. Mentioning Three Dog would be a fantastic transition to the music on the radio in Fallout 3, but YouTube's already foaming at the mouth ready to claim my video the moment they hear it, so in an effort to at least have it mentioned in the video, the soundtrack is some of the best music in a game I've ever listened to, and clearly reflects the time period of the old technology that the game has. Besides this playthrough, I don't remember the last time I didn't play a Fallout game without music on. It's one of the best additions to the game, and 3 Dog is such a comedic relief to help paint a better picture of the wasteland, even though the circumstances of the world are pretty shit. No matter what way you approach this quest, we learn more about our father and his goals. He had been working on a project called Project Purity with the intention of turning all the irradiated water into purified water again. It was basically what the vaults used to get clean water, but on a much larger scale. Our dad didn't live in the vaults. He came to Vault 101 when we were born so he could raise us in a safe environment. The project wasn't getting any results for a long time, so morale and support dwindled, which is why he then abandoned the project. Later, he realized he needed to restart Project Purity up again as he may have found an alternative method that would make the project work, and that's why he left us assuming we wouldn't chase after him. This alternative was the Gek. The Gek was used to help Vault Dwellers repopulate and grow communities. Fit with items used for power consumption, seeds for farming, and other necessities, it was the perfectly packaged device for a post-nuclear world. That was for the vaults that were meant to open. Remember how I said Vault 101 wasn't supposed to open? 
That means it didn't have a GEC. Dr. Lee points us towards the Jefferson Memorial as that's where Project Purity was started, except he's nowhere to be seen and there's a hollow tape that points us to Vault 112. Vault 112 is an interesting vault. It's very small with little things inside, two clinics and a giant room with pods. No mess halls, no beds, nothing, which is already suspicious as it is. Upon entering the pod, we're transported to Tranquility Lane. Vault 112 is intended for 80 plus occupants. The reason there's a lack of anything in this vault is because it was only there to care for the needs of the overseer, Dr. Stanislaus Braus, the creator of the GEC and the little girl in the simulation. Dr. Braun used this as his plaything. Once a person entered, they would not be able to leave as Dr. Braun was under complete control. If he was ever bored, he could just virtually kill them, wipe their memory, and resurrect them within the program to start anew. It's always been up to debate on what his true intentions were with this experiment. If all he intended to do was toy with them, then he succeeded. But if he was really a simple doctor trying to make a peaceful safe haven away from the harsh wasteland, it seemed that it worked at some point, but then ended up being corrupted by his god complex. Since we entered, we're just as screwed as the original Vault Dwellers, trapped in here forever. But Dr. Braun or Betty offers us a way out, but we need to do things for him, like making Timmy cry, cause a divorce, and ultimately killing the entire town. Or you can simply go to the abandoned house, trigger the passcode, and initiate the shutdown protocol, which has the Chinese soldiers kill everyone. Ultimately, this ends with the Dwellers dying in some way, either death by Braun to be reborn again, or legitimately killing them with no resurrection. Only difference is Braun gets to toy with them more, or he's stuck in his own simulation alone for the rest of his life with no way out. Upon escaping, we find out our dad was inside as well, and he was the dog Doc, which explains why he wasn't dead after we slaughtered everyone. Together, you go back to Rivet City and meet with Dr. Lee again. Project Purity is up and running again now that the team is back together, but not quite yet as we need to clear the mutants out of the memorial and reboot the systems. We're almost done as we still need that Gek, but a faction known as the Enclave have some better ideas with the project. And just as we're about to have a lovely father-son talk after all these years, our dad kills himself in front of us, allowing us to escape. The Enclave have the same plan as our father with Project Purity, making fresh water and distributing it to the people of the Wasteland, except they plan to use it as a method to get people to flock to them for protection and water as a plan for the future. James wants to give people water to help others, he doesn't need anything in return. The Enclave have other ulterior motives, with the charity of providing water just being a front, which is why they shouldn't be allowed to have the control of this project. After escaping the firefight, we meet with the Brotherhood of Steel, a rival faction to the Enclave. Using the technology that Brotherhood has, you discover there's still a Gek in Vault 87. Issue is that it's surrounded by major radiation leakage, and you'll most likely die almost instantly. The only way through is through Little Lamplight, a camp made of only kids who dislike adults. Their leader is a kid named McCready, someone who you may recognize in the future. McCready needs help rescuing his friends from the Slavers of Paradise Falls. After rescuing them, he allows us entry into Vault 87. Vault 87 is the last vault we visit in the main story, and the last one we haven't discussed yet. This vault was one of the couple vaults that studied the effects of FEV, or Forced Evolutionary Virus. The dwellers of the vault became subjects and were tested on regularly. Some died almost immediately, but the ones who survived became genderless beings who were extremely muscular and tough, except as a side effect they were aggressive and their mental stability diminished. This is where the super mutants started in the capital wasteland. The one subject that was experimented on but for some odd reason didn't lose his mental state is Fox. He is a friendly super mutant in Vault 87, and saving him makes him a temporary follower for the quest, and since he's a super mutant, he also has resistance to radiation, meaning he can get the Gek to us, making this quest a whole lot easier. After obtaining the Gek, we are ambushed and taken by the Enclave. President John Henry Eden wants a word with us, and gives us the potential of an ending for the last quest. If we take the modified FEV he gives us, we can sabotage Project Purity. The Wasteland clearly needs assistance. Project Purity is one part that's going to help with that assistance. The abundance of ghouls and super mutants and other irradiated personnel in the Wasteland is also a problem that needs fixing. So with the FEV vial, we can wipe out all of them, except the purifier isn't going to be pumping out fresh pure water. So it's either pure water, but the mutant schools and radiated people roam free, or no mutant schools and irradiated people, but the water is still unpurified and likely will still be for quite some time giving the player a moral choice. No matter what your decision is, we need to escape this base, and once we do, a fellow friend arrives to assist us. So we escape this facility and take the fight to the Enclave, as the anti-communist robot Liberty Prime is ready to go. This mission is more about avoiding the giant nukes of Liberty Prime than avoiding the bullets of the Enclave, but it's great and comedic to hear Liberty Prime shout anti-communist comments while nuking the streets of the Capital Wasteland. Entering the room of the Purifier, we have three options. We use the code, we use the FEV virus, or we do absolutely nothing. Each option ends the game unless broken steel was installed, which we'll cover later in the video. But to activate the code, it's either on us or sent an alliance to do so, with the code being the old passage our mom loved, which is a nice throwback to the beginning scene. This without broken steel is the ending of the game. Even if the player selects alliance to do so, the only way to progress in the game again is to revert to last save and not finish the final mission. This quest line was pretty nice, I'd say. Was it revolutionary? No, but it wasn't a terrible one. And it always bothered me how you could never justify your actions as why you left. 
You couldn't tell your father that Jonas was killed and that we were next if we didn't leave and find him. Regardless though, it's a nice quest line and still entertaining to play through. While the main quest drives the player through the game, it's the side quests that I always found that keep them hooked. With so many areas to explore, there's many quests the player can come across and sink hours into. Fallout 3, like any game of its kind, has loads of side quests, and because there's so many, just like the marked locations, I want to cover a few that really show the true diversity and strength of the side quests in this game. So let's go back to the bizarre town of Canterbury Commons. Upon arriving, we see two people fighting in costumes the antagonizer and the mechanist. It's quite the sad tale actually as Tanya the antagonizer saw her parents killed in front of her by giant ants. She was also a pretty huge fan of the Grognak comic series back in the day and as a form of trauma took the role of the antagonizer from the comics as the supervillain's origin story closely resembled Tanya's. The reason she attacks this town specifically is because her family would travel here quite often on caravan trips and now saw this as a blight on the wasteland. The mechanist is a 40 year old man named Scott who had a rough childhood but ultimately settled down in Canterbury Commons living a peaceful life as the mechanic of the town. It's learned from some of the townsfolk that during one of the antagonizer's raids she destroyed one of Scott's robot creations which made him very upset and thus became the mechanist to stop her. The townsfolk really don't care how you handle it just that you do and you have three options as well. Killing one of them, killing both of them, or killing neither of them and handling it through dialogue, which is the hardest choice. It's not a particularly long quest since their layers are super close to town and it will probably take no longer than 10 minutes, but I do like the added detail of actually going with one of them to fight the other and not just handling the whole thing yourself, as well as the small sprinkle of story that tells us how things got to be this way as I feel like some quests just kind of miss that mark entirely. When roaming the wastes on the north side, some players may encounter a gentleman known as Tree Father Birch in Oasis. He rambles for quite a bit, but then mentions that we were summoned by him, him representing their god who we have the pleasure of meeting. Their god is a talking tree. If that's not already bizarre enough, what's even more bizarre is that Harold is not a talking tree, he's a human being. Well, mutated human being. Harold underwent those FEV tests we talked about earlier, except his exposure and reaction to the virus was slightly different, eventually forming into this being we see here. Inside him sprouted a tree-like species called Bob that slowly overtook him and turned him into this tree. Even though he is definitely in far than ideal circumstances, he still keeps that comedic personality of his, as though even though the tree's name is Bob, he always found it funnier to call him Herbert as it makes him mad. Harold is sick of this place and wants to leave, and the only way to do that is death, so he hopes that you will grant him that. You could alternatively burn him, but he wants to go out painless and not burn to death as he's afraid of fire. When exiting the sacred grounds, a conversation between Mother Laurel and Father Birch can be overheard, and the two have some conflicting ideas. Both appreciate Harold as the god of Oasis, but Father Birch sees Harold as the gift to the people of Oasis, and wants to contain his influence as to not attract any unwanted attention from the outside world. Laurel wants to spread his influence past Oasis so the whole wasteland can benefit from Harold and his blessings. So now there's a three-way choice again. Surprisingly, none of these options are bad, besides burning him. If you disobey Harold, he will mention how he talked to Father Birch and realized that these people would be lost without their god, so he needs to be there to fill that role for them. If you disobey the tree minders, Father Birch isn't upset with you as he has a conversation with Harold and realizes what you told him is the truth, and he should have been more open to Harold and talking with him more than just immediately writing him off as some higher being, ruining the bond between them. But thanks to you, in some way, it's restored. But sometimes it's good to go back to your roots. Not those roots, but your early beginnings, which is why it was really cool to visit Vault 101 again after so long in the wastes. After seeing your dead die, a Vault 101 stress call is made by Amada for you to return. Once you enter, you're greeted by Officer Gomez, the one guard that's always been nice to us. There has been a feud going on between the Vault residents and the upper security. The Vault residents led by Amada want to see the outside world. They don't want to leave permanently, just be able to come and go as they please and still have a bed to rest at in the vault. But the overseer, Amada's father, is still trying to uphold his mission by keeping the vault from never opening. The player decides the fate of the vault and can use their knowledge of the world as a catalyst for their decision. Some players may remember the beauty of Megaton and that it's there to help the survivors of the waste who need residence, but players can also remember the creatures throughout the waste that kill anything they see, which may incline you to keep them inside, especially considering that right near Megaton is Springvale Elementary, which is overrun by raiders, so one wrong turn and they're all dead. Each issue is acceptable to do, assuming you're achieving it through dialogue and not killing the vault dwellers, as that is definitely not the proper way to handle the quest. You talk with both sides, Amada and the residents, as well as the overseer to hear their differing opinions, then you take the option you prefer. Talking to the vault residents was refreshing as it's been ages since you've seen them and it was nice to catch up. You can even regroup Butch as a companion now if you talk to him, but I couldn't as I, um, 
Oh. A big problem that can help this decision is the issues with the vault that we explained in the previous section of the video. Because the vault was never meant to be open, inbreeding was bound to occur, and the vault population was dwindling lower and lower over the years. If you convince the overseer to let them go, he agrees after some time, as he had noticed the population wouldn't survive more than another generation or so thanks to the need to inbreed with the other members, causing genetic stagnation. Alternatively, you can convince Amada, as you have first-hand experience, how dangerous the outside world is, and that staying in the vault is the best way to survive. Some people could see this quest and help Amada regardless, because she was the one that helped us way back when. But the people of Vault 101 are a family to you, so it's only fair that you help them out in their time of need, no matter what choice you decide to make. Our last quest takes place in Rivet City. Near Dr. Lee is an old man named Dr. Zimmer. He's looking for someone. A synthetic humanoid or android is roaming around in the wasteland, and he has reason to believe he exists in Rivet City. Playing Fall 3 for the first time, I thought nothing of it, but it was always crazy how this was relating to Fallout 4, with the mention of synths in the Commonwealth as well as the appearances of both the Institute and the Railroad. Dr. Zimmer is a part of the Synth Retention Bureau, who lived in the Commonwealth and traveled to the Capital Wasteland to retrieve high-profile units which we know are synths. To find the synth, we need to find hollow tapes of him or ask around the Commonwealth. You can talk to dozens of NPCs to trigger this, like Moira at Megaton or some ghouls in the Underworld. This isn't a quest you can do fast and get it over with. For a player's first experience of this quest, they'll just have to hope that they come across it in some point, and assuming they explore the world to its fullest potential, they will. There is tons of potential dialogue choices and holotapes to find and discover, but once you find them, a person named Victoria Watts notices that we've been snooping around just a bit too much recently. She mentions that she is part of the Railroad, a group dedicated to giving synths their independence. Actually, quite a few NPCs, like Tulip in the Underworld, Father Clifford in Ribbit City, and a few more are also secretly a part of the Railroad too. While this quest is great on its own, it's always thought that it was better to play this after Fallout 4. Since the Institute and the Railroad are some of the main factions in that game, it can influence your decision entirely. By playing Fallout 4 before doing this mission, it's not just about choosing Zimmer or Victoria's choice, it's much bigger by choosing the Institute or the Railroad and the repercussions of your actions to those organizations. It's a quest in the beginning that, when it was just Fallout 3, was fun and definitely different compared to the rest, but truly got the love it deserved when Fallout 4 released. When Victoria is done talking, she will give us a synth component, and as we know from Fallout 4, that is the one true way to identify a synth, and tell us to give it to Dr. Zimmer. This shows that the android is truly dead, and he will leave us alone. You can instead travel to the broken portion of Rivet City and meet Horace Pinkerton. He is a surgeon and scientist who created the android's new face. Horace provides us with way more context to the situation and even gives us audio logs from the day he did the surgery on the android. The only option after this is to confront the android to tell him his true identity. Harkness will ask that you spare him and kill Zimmer for him with his plasma rifle. You can either do what he says or disobey him and turn him in, completing the quest. All four of these quests in their own way are fantastic. Throwbacks to the early days of the game, hints from a future Fallout game, or just being generally good quests. While either of them isn't long with the exception of the Android side quest, depending on how lucky you are with speaking with people, they still do provide a breather in between the main quests and are rewarding whether that's in gameplay and the ending reward or the story. As I said before, I can't talk about every quest, as that would just be too much time, but I'd love to hear your personal favorites. My two honorable mentions that sadly didn't make this list, but without a doubt are fantastic, The Wasteland Survival Guide, and The Power of Adam. But at some point there comes a roadblock. You've done every quest or you've explored every area. But not all is lost as within a 7th month period, Bethesda would release 5 DLCs in Fallout 3. So let's start from the beginning and flashback to before the bombs fell with Operation Anchorage. On January 27, 2009, 3 months after Fallout 3's release, Operation Anchorage would hit stores. It's crazy to think that this DLC and the other 4 were in stores. Like, usually games have Game of the Year editions or you just purchase them digitally, but... I still have the cases the packs came from in, back in 2009, it's a wild time. Seeing as this was a blast of the past, it's fitting this DLC was too. Operation Anchorage takes us back to the war in Alaska between the United States and China, but it's not as simple as that. While wandering the wasteland, just like any other DLC, we hear a radio signal. When we follow that signal, we meet the Brotherhood outcasts on their way back home, who need some assistance getting back. The outcasts are ex-Brotherhood of Steel members. The reason they left was they felt the current leader, Elder Lions, divulged from the Brotherhood's true mission, so they left. They still uphold that mission of scavenging the old tech, but are now separated from the group. The outcasts and the Brotherhood would eventually come back together a decade later, thanks to the truce by Elder Maxon. And he's also the same Maxon in Fallout 3, just of course, a little younger at this current moment. You can follow the group inside, and talk to the leader, Protector McGraw. The reason the outcasts are down here is because there's a locked door with some possible pre-war tech inside and they want to scavenge it, except they need a Pip-Boy to get through and we just so happen to have one. But just like the whole DLC, it's not as simple as it seems. We need to complete the entire training simulation of the Battle of Anchorage where the DLC truly starts. In the simulation, the player is stripped of all their equipment and weapons and forced to fight with what they have. You aren't allowed to loot every cabinet in the simulation and enemies disappear upon death. So the only way to get ammo, heal, or find new weapons is the various stations throughout the map, which 
which are highlighted in red. Completing the training simulation is simple, kill the general of the Chinese army, but there's a lot to do before that. With Sergeant Montgomery, we have to take out the three AA guns pelting our reinforcements. Then we need to take down the two sections of Chinese forces, remove the pulse field, then we can face the general. The enemies are all roughly the same, there are some flame units, regular foot soldiers, and then the occasional special enemies which are the Chinese snipers who are cloaked even during combat. Most of the DLC is going from point A to point B, shooting anything that isn't American and finding the glowing red stations. The game does give a lot of different types of weaponry though, like assault rifles, 10 mil pistols, missile launchers, Gauss rifles, and sniper rifles to give to you. The second portion of the DLC when you make it to the base switches things up. You're given 5 markers and a supply holotape. This supply holotape allows you to pick a set of different classes, whether it's up close combat with a combat shotgun and power fist, or heavy weapons with rocket launchers and a submachine gun. There is enough ammo stations and options for all classes to work, so everything is viable, and the markers are for your team. You're also given a range of options from these too. Infantrymen, Mr. Gusties, and sentry bots can be put on your squad, and the better the unit, the more markers it takes. Not only are they helpful as you do have limited ammo at certain spots, it's actually nice to feel like the captain of the squad would be able to do something with that title other than just having the name. After everything is done, you then fight and kill General Jing Wei. This completes the simulation and allows the door to be accessed. The sheer amount of loot in here is insane. Everything from the simulation and more is inside. Power armor, Gauss rifles, flamers, missile launchers, plasma weapons, and tons of ammo. And because you completed this, you receive power armor training, which is a much faster method than doing it through the main quest. While being distracted by the sheer amounts of loot in this bunker, you may not notice that some of the people in the outcast want to take the loot for themselves and not share, which causes a mutiny and everybody starts killing each other. There is the possibility of saving McGraw and Olin, but seeing as once they're saved, they go right back to being assholes to you, maybe it's better that they died. Thanks to not needing equipment for this, as it's strips you for your simulation, you can do this very early in the game around level 4 and level 5 with power armor and these busted heavy weapons. And if you're patient enough, you could bring all this armor to Rivet City or Megaton and sell it for tons of caps, making this a truly worthwhile DLC that only takes a couple hours to complete. Two months later, on March 24th, was the release of The Pit, which takes place in the post-apocalyptic ruins of Pittsburgh. This starts via radio signal from a man named Werner who is in need of our help. Werner needs help retrieving a cure for the mutations that plague the town. This cure is being held by the raider boss, Asher. Werner needs us to get a disguise so we look like a slave, and once found, we walk across the bridge into the pit with our goal in mind. The pit was not directly hit by atomic bombs during the Great War. The water from the nearby rivers soon became highly irradiated. A few decades before Fall 3 started, the Brotherhood of Steel sent a raid team into the pit. They killed all the raiders who occupied it and anybody else who fought back. During this, an explosion erupted in the steel mill and Asher was the only one caught in the explosion. He was presumed dead, which is why the Brotherhood never bothered to rescue him. He was then saved by scavengers and eventually became the leader of the pit. One of the issues is that the only people alive in the pit were raiders and a few scavengers, so they needed slaves to increase the population and produce more steel at the mill. The people of the pit could not have children due to this disease, which is called troglodyte degeneration, contagion, or TDC, which is why slaves were needed to increase population. We see the varying effects of this throughout the pit, with slaves having skin conditions and deformations, and the trogs, which are the final stage of the disease. TDC is a creation of the terrible working conditions of the mills, which are filled with pollution and toxins mixed with the irradiated waters of the river. A doctor here is stationed in the pit, Dr. Sandra, who's working with Asher to solve this disease and hopefully cure the people. That cure is what Werner wants. Once inside, we have to speak to Medea, a subordinate of Werner's that is the inside man to help this operation flow smoothly. But before we can start though, we're interrupted and put on steel mill duty, which is 9 times out of 10, a death sentence. To help us out with this, we can get a weapon from Marco, which is the auto axe, but there's tons of weapons inside the mill, so it's not necessary. All we need is 10 ingots, but we can grab up to 100. The more we grab, the better the reward, ranging from simple clothing and weapons to full-on power armor. From simply running around each area picking up any that I found, I ended up with 87 ingots, which is still a large amount. And you can choose to find all 100 during this quest, after the quest, or even after the DLC is finished, so there's no rush to finding all 100. The steel mill is a large area, and it's highly recommended you go through all areas, not because of the ingots, but because of the loads of items you can keep with you after it's done, which you'll be needing seeing as our gear was taken at the gate. The plan for this quest is to meet Asher, as Werner explained numerous times. Thankfully, we got invited to the easiest way to do it, the hole. The hole is an arena-style fighting pit. All slaves can attempt this fight. Contestants are then placed in an arena. The match doesn't end until one dies, or they end up both dying due to the makeshift timer of the barrels flying down filled with radiation. If the contestant survives all three rounds, they're considered free and can meet with Asher and Haven, which is our goal. We go through these three fights, taking whatever we found with us, and depending on how much looting we did, there's tons of guns and armor to help us with this. Once fighting all three, we're given permission to meet Asher. Asher congratulates us on a job well done, but knows something's up, as not many new bloods can kill many people that quickly in the pit. You can play along and say 
he wanted to join the Raiders of the Pit or just flat out kill Asher right away. He tells us about Werner and even if the speech check fails, we can promise him that while we did meet him and he did give us orders, we don't trust him and we like Asher way more as to not blow our cover. During our talk, we're interrupted as supposedly the slaves are fighting back, which is a hint that this is the signal that Werner was mentioning. While Asher deals with this, we meet up with Sandra, and the sheer shock on my face when the quest marker for the cure pointed me at a child was unexplainable. This child is the cure Werner wants. Marie is the kid of Asher and Sandra, and I understand it's weird since no one in the pit can have children, but Sandra came from the outside and wasn't subjected to the effects of the TDC. Maria was born with an immunity to TDC and the radiation, which is exactly what they need to help fight this disease and all radiation throughout the whole wasteland. And this is where the quest divulges. Now knowing everything, you can leave with or without the kid. Taking the kid makes Sandra hostile, so she has to die. You turn Maria over to Medea and go find Werner so you can turn off the power so the Trogs can overrun Haven and Uptown. Lastly is dealing with Asher, and then the slaves are saved. If you take the other route, you return to Medea without Marie, who you can threaten to find Werner's location, which makes him hostile. Both options have a similar ending reward, getting the ammo press which takes ammo or scrap and turns it into more ammo. As a test, 50 scrap metal can produce about a thousand rounds of 5mm ammo, which is quite a bit. The DLC ending is what I want to discuss though. Most choices have small moral choices, but this one is leagues above the rest. If we side with Asher, we give him the chance to keep working on the cure, but he keeps the slaves. Although he does mention that if he does find the cure, he will give everyone their freedom and stop slavery as now people can reproduce and grow the town. If we side with Warner, the slaves are freed, but we also just made a baby an orphan by taking her away and killing her parents while also killing the one doctor who's made the most progress finding the cure. There is a hypothetical third option of killing all four people, Medea, Werner, Asher and Sandra, leaving no one in charge of the pit and just leaving them to fend for themselves and hopefully abandon it. Some have claimed that the pit is beyond saving, so doing this would be the best option. Regardless though, it's one of the best interesting dilemmas this game has and one of the best DLCs this game has as well. And just the sheer surprise that the cure is a living, breathing child is absolutely insane and something I'm never gonna forget. The third DLC is Broken Steel. Broken Steel continues after the events of the main story regardless of the ending you choose, allowing you to see your father's project to the end. There is also a level extension from level 20 20 to level 30 with new perks in between those levels like changing your karma, having all the schematics unlocked, or raising all your special stats to level 9. During the main quest, the control room explodes and we're knocked unconscious, no matter if we chose lions to do it or ourselves. When we awake, Elder Lion still needs our help. Even though the Enclave are scattered from the destruction of Raven Rock, they can still somehow communicate with one another, so we're sent with our favorite robot to attack a nearby relay station until Liberty Prime is blasted away, bringing a tragic start to the DLC. While not many answers were found at the station, we did find some encrypted codes that could help us. The scribe also sends us on a mission through the deathclaw infested town of Old Oni to get a Tesla coil. This Tesla coil is for the Tesla cannon we receive in the next mission at the Adams Air Force Base. The trek to the base is long and covered with enemies of all kinds. When we make it to the Air Force Base though, we're told that it's just us against an entire armed base. With the only things that we have with us are the Tesla cannon and anything we brought before the adventure. You have to battle through the whole base to find the air traffic control towers so you can lower the bridge on the mobile platform. This allows access inside the mobile platform, but our objective is now to blow it up. Firstly, by starting with the small inside components like the repulsion field and the control panel up to the main control terminal, which you can choose two of five locations, the base or the citadel. This is the player's opportunity to destroy the Brotherhood of Steel if they've disliked them the whole game, or you can finally finish off the Enclave in the capital wasteland. If you choose the Brotherhood of Steel, you're taken by Vertebra to see the ruins of the building, you're then caught immediately and forced to fight them. If you somehow manage to fend them off inside the citadel is piles of rubble and one door that conveniently leads to the armory. If you destroy the enclave, you're then taken by Vertebra to see the explosion as the mobile platform explodes. You can then return to the base afterwards and pick up some more Tesla cannons and ammo should you need it. Judging by the sheer amount of enemies and the new types of them being either Power Armor, Enclave, or Death Claws, this is definitely a DLC for the late game, which is understandable why it's only accessible after the main story, but depending on when you finish the story, it still may be too tough to accomplish if you aren't prepared, as you are literally a single man fighting an entire base. This DLC, while fairly long as it's just constant fighting, is somewhat short if you take those parts out. It's still a nice conclusion to the ending of the game, and the benefits of 10 more levels with more perks is always a nice bonus. This just really wasn't a DLC that I've always enjoyed though. Our fourth DLC is Point Lookout, and arguably the best DLC added to the game. The start of the quest, we must travel to the bottom of the map to Duchess Gambit. Nearby is a lady who needs help finding her daughter who went to Pilgrim's Landing and never came back. In an effort to help her, we take the same trip. Tobar the ferryman fills us in on the island, claiming there was an undiscovered treasure on it. When arriving, we're able to travel anywhere we please. We'll handle the main quest for now, then delve into the side quest a little bit later. The main quest continues to the Calvert Mansion. Inside is a man named Desmond who would love to chat if he didn't have his hands full. A group called the Tribals are raiding the mansion and we need to stop them. We go to the different wings of the house, then finish up the main entrance to 
to clear everyone out. Desmond then thanks us but still requires some assistance. He wants to know why he was attacked, so we have to go undercover within the tribals to do so. This requires a ritual where we eat the mother punga fruit. This punga fruit causes hallucinations similar to the vault we went in earlier in the video. After these hallucinations occur, we can return to the cathedral and gain entrance to the tribe, and depending on if you take your helmet off, you will notice that you have a scar on your head. In the cathedral is Nadine, that missing girl from the beginning. She came to the island to find the treasure, to have something of value to return with. She was then unsuccessful and ended up joining the group to help procure the punga fruit. We still need to fulfill Desmond's quest, which is to find out why we're being attacked, which can be done by interrogating the leader. It's discovered that the leader is simply a pawn, as the main leader is a talking machine who used to be a person named Calvert the owner of the mansion. Desmond tells us that this Calvert is one of his arch enemies and that he's been trying to kill him for years. The game once again splits the choice here, either help Calvert or help Desmond by planting or destroying a jammer that Desmond uses to keep Calvert at bay. If we help Desmond, we return to see the mansion blown up. Luckily, he was in the safe room and he still lives. We follow him to the lighthouse and kill Calvert. If we don't help Desmond, the mansion blows up, but Desmond once again still lives. If we kill him, Calvert congratulates us on a job well done that attempts to backstab us. No matter what choice is picked though, the back room is open with a microwave emitter, which is a unique version of the Mesmatron and tons of ammo and items to take. After everything is done and you wish to return, we find Nadine at the boat, who lets us know that Tobar was the one working with the tribe the whole time. He was the one who cut into our brain and left the scar. The visions were about the procedure. The saw was him cutting us open, the needle was sewing us shut, and the bobbleheads are what Tobar was saying during the procedure, which is a nice little touch to the scene that some may not catch. We can return Nadine to her mom and she says that she'll continue to drive us to Point Lookout free of charge. While the main quest is pretty nice, it can once again take you an hour or so, the side quests are always a highlight of the DLC. Some are as simple as a nice horde mode against ghouls, but some can be a wild goose chase for treasure. The Velvet Curtain starts in Motel Room 1D. When looking at a terminal, we find a Chinese transmission. We're now following in the footsteps of an Agent Yang and doing what they were told to do. We have to open a safety deposit box, which while something small is fantastic as it needs voice recognition, and the only way to do that is to play the hollow tape while you're walking around the bank, not looking at it in your pit boy. We then take the self-destruction codes, blow up the submarine, and find the hidden base for our reward, only to find out that Agent Yang was going to be set up and killed, so we now have to escape. Not only is the treasure worth it in the journey as there's tons of ammo and weapons, it was fantastic to embark on regardless. Of course, if ammo and guns aren't your cup of tea, there's a ship that once the safe is open contains tons of medical supplies. Like I said before, Point Lookout is still and will always be my favorite DLC. The atmosphere of the murky swamp filled with hillbillies who shoot first and ask questions later, coupled with the unique story and side quests make the roughly 4 hour playtime all the more worth it. The very last DLC of Fallout 3 was Mothership Zeta. A radio signal appears which leads the player towards a crashed alien ship. We are then captured by aliens, our equipment is gone, and the only objective is to get our gear and get out. This DLC adds a bunch of alien tech and weapons, and while not the best DLC to some, it's easily the best for those who want to make easy caps, as most of these weapons are high in value but low in weight, meaning you can carry tons of these with you. I left the DLC with around 30 or so alien pistols, each around 350 to 500 caps, and two cannons worth about 1500 caps, and I still haven't sold them all yet. Even if you don't have the room, there's still alien crystals in the ship that don't have any weight, meaning you can carry tons of these without any hindrance. But to even get to all that, we need to work with Soma by staging a fight, then fighting the aliens. We then meet Sally, another prisoner on the ship, who helps us by sneaking around the ship and opening things up for us. We then have to fight our way through the control center in order to escape. There is pods of other kidnapped people, and one of them is an astronaut. We need the suit of that astronaut in order to do the spacewalk so we can teleport to the different portion of the ship. The other three members of our crew are Elliot, a pre-war soldier, a cowboy named Paulson, and a samurai warrior named Toshiro. To do the spacewalk, we need to shut down the systems in the cryolab, hangar, and robot assembly. After completing the spacewalk, we then proceed to disable the death ray and kill the captain, until the rival ship arrives and we engage in some ship combat. Depending on how much you explore, of course, you can actually find Toshir before he even arrives at the captain's quarters, as for some odd reason he just mysteriously disappears. With the ship destroyed, you and the Earth are saved and you can now return home. Mothership Zeta isn't a long DLC by any means, and most of its length is due to navigating the ship as it's very large and convoluted. The logs that you can pick up from the station throughout the ship provides much needed context and story to what happened to other people, which is a nice change. But honestly, Mothership Zeta has always been okay at best for me. It's a bit out there for sure, which is fine, it's just not my personal taste. I usually play this DLC for the gameplay benefits rather than enjoy the story, as it's a quite short and nothing crazy, which is why this DLC section is so short, because there's really not much to talk about. With the end of the DLCs though, we have come to the end of the video. Fall 3 is such a fantastic game, and one that I'll always come back to from time to time, just to immerse myself in the world again when I forget the locations of the Capital Wasteland almost as if it's my first playthrough all over again. Thank you for coming along on this journey about my love letter to Fallout 3. If you enjoy this kind of style, like the video to let me know that you do, and with that, I hope I'll see you in a future video. Take care, and goodbye.